Hello out there on the live stream. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's great to have you here. If you have questions, please put them in the comments and we'll try to make them part of the show. So without further ado, we'll get started on the podcast. Uh, my guest is John Reese. John, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Howdy. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here as well. It's it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to you about async stuff. I think we both share a lot of admiration and love for asyncing, async IOing all the things. I, I definitely do. It's um, it's it's one of those cases where uh, the the things that it enables is so different, and you have to think about everything so differently when you're when you're using async IO that it's it's a, a nice challenge, but also has you know potentially really high payoff if it's done well. Yeah, it has a huge payoff. And I think that it's been a little bit of a mixed bag in the terms of res the reception that people have had. I know there have been a couple of folks who've written articles like, well, I tried it, it wasn't that great. Um, but there's also, you know, I've had examples where I'm doing something like web scraping or actually got a message from somebody who listened. I think maybe they were listening to Python Bytes, my other podcast. But anyway, I got a message from a listener after we covered some cool async IO things and web scraping, they had to download a bunch of stuff. And like, it takes like a day, <laughs> literally it takes all day or something. It was really crazy. And then they said, well, now I'm using async and now my computer runs out of memory and crashes. It's getting it so fast. Like that's a, <laughs> that's a large difference <laughs> right there, right? So yeah. there's certainly a, a category of things where it's amazing. Yeah, I think yeah. The, uh, the case we've uh, seen it most useful for is definitely, um, doing those sorts of like concurrent web requests. Mm -hmm. um, internally, it's also extraordinarily useful in monitoring situations um, where it's like you want to be able to talk to a whole bunch of servers as fast as possible. And maybe the amount of stuff that comes back from it is not as important as being able to just talk to them repeatedly. But um, yeah. it, uh, but you're, you're right. There's definitely a lot of cases where people are are not necessarily using it correctly or they're, they're hoping to like add a little bit of async into an existing thing. And that doesn't always work as well as just, you know, building something that's async from the start. Yeah. And there's more frameworks these days that are, you know, welcoming of async from the start, I guess we'll say. Yeah. We're going to talk, yeah, talk about that. But before we get too far down uh, the main topic, let's just start with a little bit of background on you. How'd you get into programming in Python? Sure. Um, so my first interaction with the computer was when I was, you know, maybe like five or six years old. My parents had a, a TI-99 4A, which is like the knockoff Commodore attached to the <laughs> uh, television. Yeah. And uh, my biggest... I, I wonder how, that, like, I think back to that, like, how could you have, like, legible text on the CRT? I, it, it, was it was pretty it's, bad. Um, it's bad, right? <laughs> it's like, I, my biggest memory of it is really just every time we would try to play a game and the cartridge or tape or whatever wouldn't work correctly, it would just dump you at a basic prompt where it's just expecting you to start typing some programming in. And like nobody in my family had a manual or knew anything about programming at the time. I was, so it's like, there was like, I think maybe we figured out that you could like print something to the screen, but nothing beyond that. Right. Um, and, and it wasn't until we ended up getting a, uh, a, a DOS computer, you know, a few years later that I uh, really started to actually do some quote unquote real programming where uh, we were writing like batch scripts to do menus for like, you know, deciding what program to run or, or things like auto exec bat on a floppy disk in order to uh, boot into a game. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking of all the auto exec bat stuff yeah. that we had to do. Like, oh, you want to play Doom, but you've got you don't have enough high memory, whatever the heck yeah. that was, and so you've got to rearrange where the drivers like, are. I mean, what's what a weird way to just go? Yeah, I want to play like, a game, so I've got to rework where my drivers are. Located. Make Remember. sure you don't load your mouse uh, driver when you're booting into this one game that doesn't need the mouse because otherwise you run out of memory. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and and my biggest memory of programming there was you know. There was QBasic on it, and it came with this gorilla game where you just like throw bananas at another gorilla from like uh, some sort of like city skyline. And I had again not like really a, a King Kong knockoff, Donkey Kong yeah, knockoff type thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> okay. And I would struggle to figure out how that was actually doing anything. And it was like I'd try to poke at it and, and figure it out as I went. Didn't really do that much. 
Um, but it was actually my first opportunity for quote unquote open source projects because there's a video game that I really, really liked called NASCAR racing. And one of the things that I learned was you, um, is on the burgeoning part of the internet, uh, for me at least was people would host these mods for the game on like GeoCities or whatever. And so these, these would change like the models for the cars or the wheels or, or add tracks or textures or whatever. And I actually wrote a batch script that would let you, like, at the time that you wanted to play the game, pick which of the ones you had enabled, because you couldn't have them all enabled. So it would, like, right. <laughs> it's basically just a batch script that would go and, like, copy a bunch of files around from one place to another. And then when you're done uh, with the menus or whatever, then it would launch the game. And I remember posting that on GeoCities and, you know, having that silly little, uh, like, JavaScript counter or whatever it was you know, tick up to like a couple hundred page views of people downloading just this script to to switch mods in and out. Um, and so that was like the, the first real taste of like open source programming or open source projects that I had. Um, but it, that actually like led into uh, the way that I really learned programming, which was I wanted to have my own website that was more dynamic than what GeoCities had. And so I ended up basically picking up Perl and eventually PHP to write web pages that I hosted on my own machine at home from like IIS and, <laughs> and active, how did you get uh, what did you, did you use like Dyn DNS or something like that? Or yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Dyn DNS. Um, it was, it was the jankiest setup, but it at least worked and I could impress my friends. Um, and, and it wasn't until uh, I got to college and I was working on my first internship where uh, the main project I was working on was essentially improving an open source bug tracker written in PHP in order to make it do the things that my company wanted to be able to do in it. Uh, so like adding a plugin system and things like that. And in the process of that, they I eventually became a maintainer of the project and they had a bunch of Python scripts for managing releases, like doing things like creating the release tarballs, um, running other sort of like linter type things over the code base. And that was my very first taste of Python. And I hated it because it was just like, I, I couldn't get past the, the concept of like, you're forcing me to do white space. Yeah. Like how barbaric is this? Um, but it actually didn't take long before I realized that that actually yeah. makes the code more readable. Uh, and yeah. it's like, you can literally pick up anybody else's Python script and it looks almost exactly like how you would have done it yourself. Yeah. And you got a lot of the pep eight rules and tools that automatically re you know, format stuff into that. So it's very likely, you know, you've got black and pie charms reformat yeah. and, and whatnot. It, right. Th this was all before that. So I think this was when like Python two, six was the latest. Um, this is quite a while ago, but right before the um, big, uh, diversion where there was, yeah, split. yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I had no idea what Python three was until like three, two or three, three came out because it was just sequestered in this world of writing scripts for whatever version of Python was on my Linux box at the time. Right. 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 Yeah. I, you know, I suspect in the early days, probably the editors were not as friendly or accommodating, right? Like now, if you work with PyCharm or VS Code or something, you just write code and it automatically does the formatting and the juggling and, and whatnot. And you, you know, once you get used to it, you don't really think that much about it. It just magically happens as you work on code. Yeah, um, I, I'm wanting to say at the time I was just doing something stupid like Notepad++ or, <laughs> you know, one of the other like really right, generic right, right. free text editors. Like Notepad. But or it was Eclipse. Wants, it yeah. might have been Eclipse. <laughs> yeah was it maybe PyDev? i don't think i ever used a python specific editor like yeah. i think i've tried pycharm exactly once and i do just enough stuff that's not python that i don't want to deal with a an ide or editor that's not generalized right sure makes sense uh speaking of stuff you work on what do you do day to day like what kind of stuff do you do Sure. So um, I'm a production engineer at Facebook on our internal Python foundation team. And so most of what I do there is, you know, building infrastructure or developer tools, uh, primarily enabling engineers, data scientists, and AI or ML researchers to, you know, do what they do in Python every day. So 
yeah, some cool. of that is like building out the system that allows us to integrate open source third party packages into the Facebook repository. Um, some of that is literally developing new open source tools for developers to use. Um, so a, a while back, I, I built a tool called called Bowler that is basically a refactoring tool for Python. It's based off of lib two to three that's in you know open source Python and essentially gives you a way to make safe code modifications rather than using regular expressions, which are terrible. Yeah. For um, sure. well, and, based on like the AST or something like that. That's yeah, exactly. Actually, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's like the, the benefit of lib CST is that it, it takes in um, the concrete syntax tree. So it keeps track of all the white space comments and everything else. So that if you modify the tree in um, in lib two to three, it will then allow you to write that back out exactly the way the file came in, whereas the AST module would have thrown all of that you know metadata away. Right, um, right. formatting spaces, whatever, it doesn't care. Yeah, and uh, one of the newer projects I've worked on is called uh, Usort, and it's um, like microsort, um, mm -hmm. essentially. It's a replacement that we're using internally for iSort because iSort has some potentially destructive behaviors in its default configuration. And our, our goal was essentially to get uh, import sorting done in a way that does not um, require adding um, comment directives all over the place. Right, so right, the, right. The, the obvious example of that would be if you import some module and then you won't need to call a function out of it. Like maybe that function will modify the import semantics or add an, a special import hook or things like that. Um, or turn off network access is like the two uh, main use cases we see. Uh, and then you go and import more stuff after that. With iSort, it would try to move all those imports above the function call that blocks the network oh, access. Oh, interesting. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want that to happen first, and, and then it can and go And you crazy, can't right? just put a skip directive on that function call mm -hmm. because that just means iSort won't try to sort that one, but it'll sort everything else around it as well. Um, and so what we ended up seeing was a lot of developers doing things like iSort skip file and just turn off import sorting altogether. Yeah. So uh, one of the things of, of usort is like, first, do no harm. Um, so it's, it's trying its best to make sure that these common use cases are just treated normally and correctly from the start. Uh, and so in, in most cases, it's a much safer version of iSort. It's not complete. Uh, it's not a 100% replacement, but it's the thing we've been using internally. And it's, uh, one of the cases where I'm, I'm, you know, proud of the way that we are helping to build better tools for the ecosystem. Yeah, this is really neat. I never really thought about that problem. One thing that does drive me crazy is sometimes I'll, I'll need to change the Python path so that future imports, regardless of your working directory, behave the same if you don't have a package or something like that, right? Something simple. Yeah, that's super common in the AI and ML type of workflows. Yeah. Yeah. And I get all these warnings like you should not have code that is before an import. Like, well, but this one is about making the import work. If I don't put this, it's going to crash for some people if they run it weirdly and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah, uh, it's so uh, interesting. Yeah. Very, very cool project. Nice. All right. So, um, yeah, let's dive into async, huh? Sure. Yeah. So maybe a little bit of history, you know, Python. Uh, it's hard to talk about asynchronous programming in Python without touching on the gill global interpreter lock normally yeah. spoken as a bad word but it's not necessarily bad it, it has a purpose um it just its purpose is somewhat counter to making asynchronous code run really quick and in parallel um, i mean uh, it's it's one yeah. of those things where if if you imagined what python would be without the global interpreter lock uh you end up having to do a lot more work to make sure that um let's say if you had multi-threading multi-threaded stuff going on you'd have to do a lot more work to make sure that they're not clobbering some shared data like you look at the way that you have to have have to have synchronizations and everything else in java or c plus plus yeah we don't generally need that in python because the gill prevents a lot of that uh bad behavior and you know the the current efforts to kind of remove the gill that have been you know ongoing for the past eight to ten years in every single case, once you remove that gill and add a whole bunch of other locks, the whole system's actually slower. So right. this is one of those things where it's like, 
it does cause problems, but it also enables Python to be a lot faster than it would be otherwise. And, and probably simpler. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the global interpreter lock, when I first heard about it, I thought of it as a threading thing. And it sort of is, but you know, it's primarily says, let's create a system so that we don't have to do locks as we increment and decrement the ref count on variables. So basically all the memory management can happen without the overhead of taking a lock, releasing a lock, all that kind of weirdness. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so yeah, no. So we've got like a bunch of early attempts. I mean, we've got threading and multiprocessing have been around for a while. There's Gvent, Tornado, but then around, I guess was it Python 3.4, we got async IO, which is a little bit of a different flavor than you know, like the computational threading or the computational multiprocessing side of uh, async. Yeah, it, it's actually an, an interesting kind of throwback to the way that uh, computing happened in like the 80s and early 90s where like Windows 3.1 or classic Mac OS, essentially uh, you can you know run your program or your process and you actually have to uh, cooperatively give up uh, control of the CPU in order for another program to work. So there'd be a lot of cases where... Um, like you're if if you had a bad behaving program, you'd end up not being able to do multitasking in you know these old operating systems because it was all cooperative. In the case of async IO, it's essentially taking that mechanism where you don't need to do uh, a lot of context switching in threads or in processes, and you're essentially letting a bunch of functions cooperatively coexist and essentially say, uh, like when when your function gets to a point where it's doing a network request and it's waiting on that network request, your function then you know will nicely hand over control back to the async IO framework, at which point the framework and event loop can go find the next task to work on that's you know that's not blocked on something. Right. Yeah, and it's very often doesn't involve threads at all, or you know the one main thread, right? Like so. Yeah. You don't. It's, yeah. it's not a like way it, to create threading. It's it's a way to allow stuff to happen while you're otherwise waiting. Yeah, in the best case, you only ever have the one thread. And now in reality, it, is, it doesn't work like that because a lot of our you know modern computing infrastructure is not built in an async way. So like if you look at file access, there's basically no real way to do that asynchronously without threads. Um, but in the best case, like uh, network requests and so forth, if you have the appropriate hooks from the operating system, then that can all be completely in one thread. And that means you have a lot less overhead from the actual runtime and, and process from the operating system because you're not having to constantly throw a whole bunch of memory onto a stack and then pull off memory from another stack and try to figure out where, where you were, you know, when something interrupted you in the middle of, you know, 50 different operations. Right. If it starts swapping out the memory it's touching, that it might you know, swap out what's in the L1, L2, L3 caches, which yeah, can exactly. have huge performance impacts. And it's just constantly cycling back and forth out of control a lot of times, right? Yeah. Uh, so in, in a lot of our testing uh, internally, when I was working on things that would talk to lots and lots of servers, it's like we would hit a point where somewhere between 64 and 128 threads uh, would actually start to see less performance overall because it just spends all of its time trying to um, context switch between right, all of these threads right, because right, right. You, you're interrupting these threads you know at an arbitrary point in time because the the runtime is trying to make sure that all the threads are serviced equally but in reality like half of these threads don't need to be uh, given the context right now so um, by you know doing those sort of interrupts and context which is, when the runtime wants to, rather than when the functions or requests are wanting to, you end up with a lot of suboptimal behavior. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and also things like um, locks, mutexes, and stuff don't work <laughs> in this yeah. world because you're, it's it's about you know what thread has access. Well, it's all the all the codes on one thread. So to me, the real zen of async IO, at least at for many really solid use cases, kind of like we touched on, is it's all about scaling when you're waiting. Like if I'm yes. waiting on something else, it's like completely free to just go to it. If I'm calling microservices, external APIs, uh, if I'm you know downloading something or uploading a file or talking to a database or even maybe accessing a file with something like AIO files, 
Yeah. 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 There's a cool, let me see if I got the right place. Yeah. There's a cool uh, place called AI, uh, awesome async IO by Tim Elfure, which is pretty cool. Have you seen this place? I have looked at it in the past. Um, I end up spending so much time looking at and building things. It's like, I haven't actually gotten a lot of opportunity to use a bunch of these. Um, I, most of my time, I am actually not working that high enough on the stack to make use of them. Right, right, right. These are more, uh, a lot of them are frameworks. But you do have some other uh, neat things in there as well, like async SSH. I hadn't heard of that one. But anyway, I'll put that that in the show notes. That's got, I don't know, 50, 60 libraries and packages for solving different problems with async IO, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Whenever I talk about async IO, one thing I love to give a shout out to is this thing called unsync. Have you heard of unsync? I had not heard about it until I looked at the show notes, um, but it sounds a lot like some of the some of the things that I've seen people implement a lot of different cases. Um, it's it's a very filling a, co- a common sort of use case where you have, like I was saying earlier, where people want to mix async uh, async IO into an existing synchronous application. You yeah. do have to be very careful about how you do that, um, especially vice versa or or a lot of the the stumbling blocks we've seen tend to be cases where you have synchronous code that calls some async code that then wants to call some synchronous code, but on like another thread so that it right. it's not blocked by it. And you actually end up getting this like uh, in out, in out sort of thing where you have like nested layers of, of async IO. Uh, I'm <laughs> not sure how much this may or may not solve that, but I, I um, think this actually helps uh, some with that as well. Basically the idea is there, there's two main things that it solves that I think is really neat. One, it's like a unifying layer across multi-processing, multi-threading mm-hmm. and straight yeah. async IO, right? So you put a decorator onto a function. If the function is an async function, it runs it on async IO. If it's a regular function, it runs it on a thread. And if you say it's a regular function, but it's computational, it'll run it on and multiprocessing, but it gives you basically an async IO, async and await API for it. And it, it figures out how to run the loop and all. Anyway, it's and pretty cool. Not what we're here to talk about, but it's, it's definitely worth uh, checking out uh, while we're on the subject. Sorry, ultimately, it gives you a, just a future that you can then either await or, or ask for the result from, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. And the result, you instead of saying, you've got to wait till it's finished before you can get the result, you just go, give me the result. And if it needs to, it'll just block. So it's a nice way to sort of cap the async IO. You know, like one of the challenges of async IO is, well, five levels down the call stack, this thing wants to be async. So the next thing's async. So the next thing I'll say sync. And like all of yeah. a sudden, everything's async, right? And so it was something like this. I mean, you could do it yourself as well. You can like just go create an event loop, run it, and And at this level, we're not going to be async above it, but we're coordinating stuff below using async IO. And and here's where it stops. Yeah, it it sounds like a a nicer version of of what I see, you know, dozens of when you have lots and lots of engineers that, you know, aren't actually working on the same code base together, but they're all in the same repository. And we end up seeing these cases where everybody has solved the same use case. So I I do think this would be useful and I'm actually planning on uh, sharing it with more people. Yeah, yeah, check it out. It's like a, a subtotal, I think, 126 lines of Python in one file. But it's it's really cool, this unifying API. All right. Um, so I guess that probably brings us to Omnilib. You want to talk about that for a little bit? So this this is what sure. I, I thought would be fun to have you on the show to really focus on is like async IO, but then also you've created this thing called Omnilib, the Omnilib project that has, solves a, what's it four four problems four different problems with async io and obviously you can combine them together i would expect Mm -hmm. yeah um i the the origins of this really is like i i had built the like aio sqlite was the first thing that i uh, wrote that was an async framework um and then i'd built a couple more and at one point i realized these projects are actually getting really popular and people are using it but they're just like one of the hundred things that are on my GitHub profile and graveyard. So <laughs> I, I really felt like they needed to have their own separate place for like, these are the projects that I, I'm actually proud of. Um, and I, I thought that was actually a good opportunity to be able to make a, a dedicated like project or um, um, 
organization for it and essentially say that everything under this um, I'm guaranteeing is going to be developed under you know a very inclusive code of conduct that I you know personally believe in um, and want to try and also at the same time make it more welcoming and supportive of you know other contributors especially newcomers or other or otherwise marginalized developers in in the ecosystem um, and try to be as friendly as possible with it and it's like this is something that I tried to do beforehand and I just never really formalized it on any of my projects other than like here's a code of conduct uh, file in the repository yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this is like really one of the first times where I, I wanted to put all these together and make sure that these are really like this is going to be whether or not enough people make it a community, I want it to be welcoming from the outset. Right. That's um, really cool. And you created your own special GitHub organization that you put in all under and stuff like that. So it's yeah. kind of the things that it graduated from your personal projects. Is that the story? Uh, yeah. And, and kind of the threshold I tried to follow is like, if this is worth making a Sphinx documentation site for, then it's worth putting on, <laughs> you know, OmniLib projects. So they're yeah, not all sense. async IO. That just happens to be where a lot of my interest and utility uh, stands at. So um, that's, you know, that's what most of them are, or at least the, the most popular ones. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other projects that I have also in the back burner that will probably end up there that, uh, maybe not as useful of libraries or whatever, but either way, um, the, like I said earlier, these are the ones that I'm at least proud of. Nice. That's cool. So you talked about the, the being there to support people who are getting into open source and, and whatnot and having that code of conduct. What other than that, is there like a mission behind this? Like I want to make this category of tools or solve these types of problems, or is it just, these are the things that you graduated? I, it's something I've tried to think about. I'm not a hundred percent certain. Um, I, I would like it to have maybe more of a, a, a mission, but at the same time, it's like, um, especially from things I've had to deal with at work, it's like, I don't want this to be a dumping ground of stuff either. Like I, I want this yeah. specifically as yeah. like, like in the, the opening statement, I want it to be a group of high quality projects that are you know following this code of conduct. So from that perspective, it's like, at the moment it's like, my personal interests are always in building things where I find gaps in, you know, availability from other libraries. So that's probably the closest to a mission of what belongs here is just things that, that haven't been made yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but either way, I just want to have that, you know, dedication to the, the statement of like, I, I want these to be high quality. I want them to be tested. I want them to be, you know, uh, have, continuous integration and testing and, and well-documented and so forth. Yeah. Super cool. All right. So there's four main projects here on the homepage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have the attribution one, but that's, that's just kind of uh, bookkeeping. It's like right? helper tool. <laughs> exactly. So you've got, well, let's, let's talk about the things that um, maybe that are the AIO extension of. <laughs> so we, in Python, we have iter tools. Right, which is like mm -hmm. tools for easily creating generators and such out of collections and whatnot. Uh, so you have AIO iter tools, which is awesome. And then we have multiprocessing, which is a way around the gill. It's like, here's a function and some data, go run that in a sub process and then give me the answer. And because it's a sub process, it has its own sub gill or its own separate gill. So it's all good. So you have AIO multiprocess, which is cool. And then you know, one of the most widely used databases is SQLite, already built into Python, which is super cool. And uh, so you have AIO SQLite, and then sort of extending that, that's like a raw SQLite, you know, raw SQL library that's async IO. Then you have AQL, which is more ORM-like. I'm not sure it's 100% ORM. You could categorize it for us, but uh, it's yeah, like I, ORM. I... Yeah, I've definitely um, used like in quotes, in scare quotes, uh, ORM light, um, right. because I, I want it to be able to essentially be a combination of um, like well typed table definitions that you can then use to generate queries against the database. Um, as of right now, it's more like writing a like a DSL that lets you write a uh, backend agnostic. Uh, SQL statement. Right. Um, okay. 
but yeah, DSL domain specific language for people yeah. who aren't totally sure. Um, so really, it's essentially just stringing together a whole bunch of method calls on on a table object in order to get a uh, SQL query out of it. Um, the the end goal is to be able to have that actually be um, a full end to end thing where you've defined your tables and you get objects back from it, and then you can like call something on the objects to get them to you know update themselves back into a database, but um, I've been very hesitant to um, pick an API on it for how to actually get all that done because the trying to do that in an async fashion is actually really difficult to to do it right. Yeah. Uh, as, and separately, like trying to do async IO and have everything well typed is you know it's like two competing problems that that have to be solved. Yeah, I just recently started playing with SQL Alchemy's uh, 2.0, 1.4 beta API where they're doing the async stuff. And it's it's quite different than the traditional uh, SQL Alchemy. So yeah, you can yeah. see the challenges there. And, and it's also a case where it's like um, having something to generate the queries to me is more important than having the thing that will actually go run the query, um, especially for a lot of internal use cases uh, we really just want something that will generate the the query, or we already have a system that will will talk to the database once you give it a query and parameters. It's the piece of actually saying, defining what your uh, table hierarchy or structure is, and then being able to run stuff to get the actual SQL query out of it, but have that work for both SQLite and MySQL or Postgres or, or whatever other uh, backend you're using. Having it be able to use the same code and generate the correct uh, the correct query based off of which database you're talking to is the important part. Yeah, cool. Well, there's probably a right order to dive into these, but since we're already talking about the AQL one a lot, maybe maybe you could give us an example of like what you can do with it. Maybe talk us through. Uh, it's hard to talk about code on air, but just give us a sense yeah. of what kind of code you write and what kind of things it does for us. So um, this is heavily built around the, the idea of using uh, data classes. In this case, it specifically uses adders, um, simply because that's what I was more familiar with at the time that I started building this. But essentially, you create a class with, you know, essentially all of your columns specified on that class with right. the, but the name and not, the type. Not like SQL... But not like or super Django heavy, style, like, yeah, right? exactly. Like native types like ID colon int, name colon yeah. stir, not SA dot column, column dot, you know, SA dot string and so on, right? That yeah, exactly. Like okay. I, I want this to look as close to a normal data class definition as possible. Um, and essentially be able to decorate that and you get a special object back that when you use methods on it, like in this case, the example is uh, you're, you're creating a contact. So you list the, the the integer ID, the name of it, and the email. And you know whether those are like uh, whatever the primary key doesn't really matter in this case. Uh, whether the the ID ends up getting auto incremented again doesn't really matter. What we're really worried about is generating the actual uh, queries. And you're assuming and so, like somebody's created the table, it's already got a primary key for ID, it's auto incrementing or something like that, and you yeah. just want to talk to the thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so essentially you take this uh, contact class that you've created and you can call a select method on it that will then, you know, you can uh, add an, a, a where method to, to decide which contacts you want to select. Uh, there's other methods for, you know, changing the order or limits or furthermore, if you wanted to do joins or other sorts of things, like it kind of expects that, you know, what general uh, SQL syntax looks like um, because you you string together a bunch of stuff kind of in the same order that you would with a uh, with a SQL query. But the difference is that in this case, like when you're doing the where clause, rather than having to do an arbitrary string that says, you know, column name like, yeah. uh, and then s some uh, string literal, um, in this case, you're, you're saying like where contact dot email dot like, and then passing the thing that you want to check against. And um, the other alternative is you could, if you wanted to look for a specific one, you could say like where contact.email equals equals 
and then the the value you're looking for. And so you're you're kind of using or abusing Python's uh, expression syntaxes uh, to essentially yeah. build up your query, definitely using a domain spe specific language in this case. And um, but essentially having the fluent API, you once you string all this together, you have this query object, which you can then you know pass to the appropriate engine to get an actual uh, finalized SQL query and the parameters that would get passed if you were doing a um, a prepared query. Um, but you could also potentially like in the future, the the goal was you would also be able to can make manage your connection with AQL and basically be able to tell it to run this query on that connection. Um, and regardless, you'd be able to do this the same with SQLite or MySQL or whatever. And the library is, is the part that handles deciding, you know, what specific part of, you know, the incompatible SQL uh, languages that they all use will, will actually be available. Right. Yeah, like for example, MySQL uses question mark for the parameters. Yeah, um, SQL Server uses, I think, at parameter name. There's like all they all have their own little style. It's not the same, right? Yeah, and it's um, some of that is kind of moot because of the fact that the uh, most of the like, engine libraries that we use uh, commonly in Python, like AIO, MySQL, or um, or SQLite or whatever, they're already kind of um, unified around the, there's there's a, a specific PEP that defines what the database interface is going to look right, like. DB API 2 or whatever it is. Yes, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that work has already been done by the PEPs and by the actual uh, database engines. But there's a lot of cases where it's a little bit more subtle, um, like the semantics, especially around using a, a like expression. Um, MySQL does a, um, a case insensitive matching by default, but SQLite doesn't. Uh, so AQL tries to kind of like unify those where possible, um, but also there's, there's cases, especially when you're getting into joins or group buys, things like that, where the the actual specific syntax being used will start to vary between the different uh, backends, and and that's right. where we we've had more issues. Like especially the whole point of SQLite for a lot of people is to, as a drop in replacement to MySQL when you're running your unit tests, um, and so you want your code to be able to do the same thing regardless of what database engine it's connected to, uh, and this is one way to do that. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, with SQLite you can say the database lives in you know colon memory. Colon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you can just tear it up for your unit tests and then it just goes away. It's nice. Yeah. So uh, maybe that brings us to the next one, the AIO SQL Lite. Uh, sure. This one, this one is all about async IO. You can see from the example here. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so this was again born out of you know a need for using SQLite, especially in in testing frameworks and so forth to replace uh, MySQL. And essentially what I was doing was uh, taking the, the normal SQLite API from uh, Python and es essentially saying like, how would this you know, look in an async IO world? Like if, if we were re-implementing uh, SQLite from the ground up in an async IO world, how can we do that? Um, and essentially, so in this case, we're heavily using um, async context managers and awaitables in order to actually run the database connection to SQLite on a separate thread and provide as much of an async interface to that as possible. So when you connect to AIO SQLite, it spawns a background thread that actually uses the, the standard SQLite library to connect to your database. And then it has methods on that thread object that allow you to actually make calls into that database. And those are essentially proxied through futures. So if you want to execute a query, um, when you await that uh, query execution, it will spawn basically... 
queue the function call on the other thread and basically tell it, here's the future to set when the result is ready. So once the SQLite execution or cursor or whatever has actually completed doing what it's supposed to do on that background thread, it then goes back to the original threads event loop and says, you know, set this future to, to finished. And right. so that allows the, the thing answer. that's originally yeah. awaiting it to actually come back and uh, do something with the result. Yeah, that sounds a little tricky, but also super helpful. And people might be thinking, didn't we just talk about the gill and how threading doesn't really add much? But when you're talking over the network or you're talking to other things, a lot of times the gill can be released while you're waiting on the internal SQLite or something like that, right? Yeah, so the, the internal SQLite library on its own will release the gill when, um, when it's calling into the underlying SQLite C library. Uh, and that's where it's waiting, so that's good. Yeah, and I mean, the other, the other side of this is that it's one thread. Um, I'm not really aware of anybody who's opening, you know, hundreds of simultaneous connections to uh, a, SQL, a SQLite database the way that people expect to do with, say, like AIO HTTP um, or things like that. So yeah. while it is, you know, potentially less efficient if you wanted to do a whole bunch of parallel SQLite uh, connections, um, the the problem really is that SQLite itself is not thread safe. So it has to have a dedicated thread for each connection. Otherwise, you risk um, corruption of the uh, backing database. Which sounds not good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like basically you end up either where, uh, where two threads clobber each other or more specifically what SQLite says is if you absolutely try to talk to a connection from a different thread, uh, the Python module will complain unless you've specifically told it, no, please don't complain. I know it's unsafe. At which point SQLite will be really upset if you try to do a write or, or modification to that database. So there are layers of protections against that, but it is one of the underlying limitations that we have to deal with in this case. So if you yeah. wanted to have simultaneous connections to the same database, you, you really have to spin up multiple threads in order to make that happen safely. You could always do some kind of uh, thread pool type thing, like we're only going to allow eight connections at a time and you're just going to block until uh, one of those yeah, becomes free and finished or whatever, right? It's um, it's definitely a, a tricky thing. So like the, the expected use case with AIO SQLite is that you'll share the database connection between multiple um, workers. So you'll like... In, in the piece of your application that starts up, it would make the connection to the database and store that somewhere and then essentially pass that around. And so AIO SQLite is basically expecting to use a queue system to say whoever gets the query first um, is the one that you know gets to run okay. it first and whoever, yeah. whoever asks for the query second you know, is, is the second one to get it. So you're still doing it all on one thread and it's slightly less performant that way, but it's at least safe. Right. And still yeah, asynchronous, yeah. at least. Yeah, that's good. Very nice. And uh, one of the things that looking at your example here, which I'm, I'll link in the show notes, of course, is Python has a lot of interesting constructs around async and await. You know, a lot of languages, you know, you think C sharp or JavaScript or whatever, it's kind of async function, await function calls were good. But, you know, we've got async with async for a lot of interesting uh, extensions to working with async and other constructs. Yeah, it actually makes it really nice in some ways. And essentially these are just syntactic wrappers around a whole bunch of magic methods on, on objects. Right, um, like await thing, enter, <laughs> do your thing, right? Then await right. exit, right? Um, yeah. and, and so like the nice part is that for some amount of extra work in the library, setting up all those magic methods everywhere and deciding you know the right way to, to use them. The benefit at the end is that you have this very simple syntax for asynchronously iterating over the results of a cursor. Um, and in, in that case, you don't have to care that after you know 64 elements of, of iteration, you've exhausted the local cache and now SQLite has to go back and fetch the next batch of 64 items. Um, in, the, in that case, it's like that's transparent to your application and that's where the, the coroutine that's iterating over that cursor would then hand back its um, control of the event loop. 
and the next coroutine in in the uh, in in waiting essentially is able to then you know wake up and go do its own thing too. Right. Yeah. Oh, how cool! I didn't even really think of it that way. That's neat. All right. Uh, maybe next one to touch on would be AIO multi-process. Sure. Oh wow! Yeah, I see. It just it just now crossed a thousand stars today or recently. Oh yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, very recently. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, that, that's my real pride and joy here is, is, uh, getting all those stars. Um, so sorry. Anyways. <laughs> um, so th there's like, there's this interesting dichotomy set up between threading and multiprocessing in Python. So with multi-threading, you're able to, you know, uh, interleave execution. So with the gill, it means that only one thread can actually be modifying Python objects or running Python code at any given time. Um, so you're essentially limited to one core of your CPU. Um, there are some days, nice... that's a big limitation, right? Like... Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> like, um, I, I, I see servers on a, on a regular basis that are like 64 to a hundred cores. Um, so only using one of them is basically a non-starter. Uh, you get a lot of people with pitchforks saying, why aren't we using rust? Um, and so essentially what, the alternative of this multiprocessing, where you're spinning up an individual process and each has its own gill, um, this does allow you for CPU intensive things to basically use all of the available cores on your system. So if you're crunching a whole bunch of numbers with NumPy or something like that, uh, you could use multiprocessing and saturate all of your cores with no problem. Um, in, in this case, essentially what happens is it, it spawns a sub uh, a child process um, or forks the child process on Linux. And then it uses um, the, the pickle uh, module in order to send data back and forth between the two. And this is great and it's really transparent. So it's super easy to write, write code for multiprocessing and, and make use of that. Um, but the, the issue becomes if you have a whole bunch of really small things, um, you start to have a big overhead with um, with the pick pickling of the data back and forth, but right, even the worse than that, back and forth is like really challenging, right? Yeah. So like if, if you're pickling a whole bunch of smaller objects, uh, you actually end up with a whole bunch of overhead from the pickle module where you're se serializing and deserializing and creating a bunch in, of objects and, you know, synchronizing them across those processes. But the, the real problem is when you start to want to do things like network requests that are IO bound, um, so in, 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 sorry, in an individual process, like with multi-threading, you could probably do 60 to a hundred, uh, simultaneous network requests. Right. Um, but you guys maybe have more than 60 servers or something. Like sure. That, right? But like, <laughs> if, if you're trying to do this with multi-processing instead, where you have a, a, like a process pool and you give it a whole bunch of stuff to work on, each process is only going to work on one request at a time. Um, and yeah. so, so you might spin up a process and it waits for a couple seconds while it's doing that network request and then, and then it sends it back and you haven't really gained anything. So if you actually really want to saturate all your cores, now you need a whole bunch more processes. And that then has the problem of a whole lot of memory overhead. Uh, because even if you're using copy on write semantics with forking, the problem is that like Python goes and touches all the ref counts on everything and immediately you know, removes any benefit of, of copy on write forked processes. Right, so, which might do like the shared memory, right? So if I create 10 yeah. of these things, like 95% of the memory just might be one copy. But if you start touching ref counts and all sorts of stuff, you know, Instagram went so far as to disable the garbage collector to right. prevent that so, kind of stuff. It was insane, yeah. So it turns out that if you fork a process, uh, as soon as you get into that new process, Python touches like 60 to 70% of the objects in its, uh, in the, the pool of memory, which basically means it now has to actually copy all of the memory from all of those objects. And so you don't actually get to share that much memory between the child and the parent process in the first place. Um, so if you, you know, try to spin up, you know, a thousand processes, uh, in order to saturate 64 cores, you are wasting a lot, a lot of memory. Um, so that's where I kind of built this piece of AIO multiprocess, where essentially what it's doing is it's spinning up a process pool, um, and it only spins up one per core, um, 
And then on each child process, it then also spins up an async IO event loop. And, right. and rather than giving a normal synchronous function as the thing that you're mapping to a whole bunch of data points, you give a coroutine. And in this case, what, uh, what AIO multiprocess is capable of doing is essentially keeping track of how many in-flight coroutines each child process is executing and essentially being able to say that um, like if you wanted to have 32 in-flight coroutines per process and you had 32 processes, then of course you have you know, whatever 32 times 32 <laughs> is. And I can't do that in my head because um, I'm, I'm terrible at math. Um, <laughs> essentially you get, you know, the, the cross product of, of those two numbers. And that's the number of actual yeah. uh, concurrent things that you can do on AAL multiprocess. And so in the reality, idea is like, instead of creating a, a whole bunch of one off run this, this thing with this, these inputs over there, you say, well, let's create a chunk, like, Let's go 32 here, 32 there, and run them, but do that in an async way so you're scaling the wait times. Which yeah, exactly. Is, anyway, right, because you're probably doing network stuff. Uh, in yeah, these, and, in um, and the benefit of this is essentially like you, you're you scaling the, the benefits of async I.O. with the benefits of multiprocessing. So for math, that's easier for me to to figure out. Uh, in reality, what we've seen is that you can generally do somewhere around 256 um, concurrent network requests on async IO on a single process um, before you really start to overload the event loop. Um, and the thing Have that a lot of people at don't. Some of the other event loop implementations like UV loop or any of those alternate uh, event loop um, so... functions. The UV loop can make things faster, but the things that it makes faster are the the parts that process like network request headers. Um, the The real problem at the end of the day is that the way that the async IO framework and event loops work is that for each task that you give them, it basically adds it to a round robin queue of all of the things that it has to work on. So at the end of the day, if you want to run a thousand concurrent tasks, that's a thousand things that it has to go through in order before it gets to right. any one task. Right. And it's so going around asking, are you done? Are you done? Or, yeah. or something like and, that, basically. And yeah. if you're doing anything with the result of that network request before you actually return the the real result from your cover team, then you're almost certainly going to be starving the event loop of act or starving other coroutines on the same event loop of processing power. And so what we've seen actually is you end up with cases where um, you technically time out the request because it's taken too long for Python or async IO to get back to the network request before it hits like a TCP interrupt or something like that. Right, right. Oh, that's, um, that's interesting. Yeah, so this way you could say like, well, throw 10 processes or... 20 processes right. at it and, and make that. And shorter. so if you are, are willing to run like 256 network requests per process and you have 10 processes um, or 10 cores, then suddenly you can run, you know, 2,500 network requests simultaneously from async IO and Python. And like, at that point, you're probably saturating your network connection unless you are talking to mostly local hosts. Um, that, Facebook, when you're talking about a monitoring system, that's actually what you're doing is you're almost certainly talking to things that have super low latency to, to talk to and super high bandwidth. Um, and so this was essentially the answer to that is like run async IO event, async IO event loops on a whole bunch of child processes and then do a bunch of really like smart things to balance the load of the tasks that you're trying to run across all of those different processes in order to try and make them you know, execute as quickly as possible. And then also, um, whenever possible, try to reduce the amount of times that you're serializing things back and forth. So one of the other uh, common things that having more processes enables you to do is actually do some of the work to um, process, filter, aggregate that data in those child processes. Uh, rather than pickling all the data back to the parent process and then you know dealing with it and aggregating it there, right? Because you've already so, got the like scale out for CPU cores. Might as well yeah, do it so there. Yeah, so it kind of gives like a local version of MapReduce, 
where essentially you're, you're mapping work across all these child processes. And then inside each batch or whatever, you're, ac- you're, um, you're aggregating that data in, into the result that you then send back up to the parent process, which can then process and aggregate that data further. Yeah. Super cool. You gave a talk on this at PyCon in Cleveland, one of the last real actual in-person PyCons. <laughs> yeah. Um, also the first first one I've ever attended and the first one that I've ever given a talk at, um, or the first yeah, time that was a good one, I've that, ever given a talk. Thinking. Yeah. And yeah, the, the room was absolutely massive and terrifying. Um, and I don't know how I managed to do it all. Yeah, it's just kind of block it out, block it out. Just, <laughs> But no, it's all good. Um, cool, yeah. So I'll link to that as well. People can check that out. And it really focuses on this AIO multiprocessing part, right? Yeah. Yeah, nice. All right, last of the AIO things at Omnilib is um, AIO iter tools. Yeah, so um, you kind of hinted on this before. Like iter tools is mostly a bunch of helpers that let you, you know, process lists of things or iterables in nicer ways. Um, and AIO iter tools is just basically taking the the built-in functions like iterating, getting the next thing from, from an iterable or mapping or chaining between multiple iterables or whatever, and essentially bringing that into an async first uh, world. So all of the functions in AO iter tools will accept both uh, like normal standard iterators or lists or whatever, as well as async iterables or generators or whatever. And essentially it up converts everything to an async iterable and then gives you um, more async iterable interfaces to work on these. So, so I know how to create a, a generator with like yield. So I can have a function, mm-hmm. it does a thing, and then it goes through some processing. And it says yield an item. Like here's one of the things in the list. And that's already really good because it does like lazy loading, but it doesn't scale the waiting time, right? It just waits. Yeah. So for the async um, so it, it's tricky. How, how do you? What's case. the difference there? Um, in this <laughs> Never case, tried if, one if, of those. if you if you dec- if you just call the function async def and then have a yield statement in it, it creates an async generator, which is just an async iterable object that, um, similar to how when you call a coroutine, it's an object, but it doesn't actually run until you await it. Right. With an async generator. Calling it creates the generator object, but you don't then, actually. Then the async part is done, right? After at that point. Well, it's like it doesn't. It still doesn't even start running it until you yeah. actually start to use the async for or some other async uh, iteration to then iterate over it. Um, so you, if you're using the async iterator, you still get the the lazy loading of of everything like with a normal generator. Um, but you also have the potential for your thing to be interrupted. So the the common use case here or the expected use case would be if you're doing something like talking to a whole bunch of network hosts and you want to return the results as they come in as an async iterable, then you could use something like AIO iter tools to then do things like batch up those results or or run another coroutine across every result as it comes in, things like that. Um, and the, the other added benefit in here is that there's also a concurrency limited version of gather. So as I said earlier, when you have a whole bunch of tasks, you're actually making the event loop do a whole bunch more work. One of the common things I've seen is that people will spawn 5,000 tasks and e- each task, or they'll all have some um, semaphore that limits how many of them can execute at once. Mm-hmm. But you still have 5,000 tasks that the event loop is trying to service. And so you're, you're giving a whole bunch of overhead every time it wants to switch between things, it's got to potentially go through up to 5,000 of them before it gets to one that it can actually service. So the concurrency limited version of gather that AIO iter tools has lets you specify some limit, like only run 64 things at a time. And so it will, you know, try to fetch the first 64 things of, of all of the, the coroutines or awaitables that you give it. And um, and it will start to yield those values as they come in. But essentially, oh, it's making sure that the event loop would never see more than 64 active tasks at a time, at least from that yeah, specific. Yeah, they're just hanging out of memory. They don't get really get thrown into the, 
yeah. the running task. So one of the challenges or criticisms almost I've seen around async IO is that it, it doesn't allow for any back pressure or whatever, right? Like if I'm talking to a database, it used to be that the web front end would have like some kind of performance limit and could only go so hard against the database. But if you do just await it, like all the traffic just piles in until it potentially can't take it anymore. And it sounds like this has some mechanisms to address that kind of generally speaking. That's at least the, the general intent of it is to be able to use this concurrency limit to try and prevent um, overloading either the event loop or your network or whatever. Um, so even if you have 5,000 items, by setting the limit to 64, you know that you know, you're only going to be doing that many at a time. And, and then you can combine that, that concurrency limited gather with something like, uh, like the result of that uh, is its own you know, async iterable. And then you could also combine that with things like chain or, or other things in order to mix that in with the rest of the like iter tools functional lifestyle if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super cool. Uh, I can imagine that these might find some way to to work together. You might have some async IO, uh, or say, a, sorry, AIO iter tools thing that then you feed off to AIO multiprocessing or, or something like that. Do you put yeah, these together? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It, th these are definitely a whole bunch of tools that I've I've put together in various different use cases. Yeah, very neat. All right, well, we're getting quite near the end of the show. I think uh, we've talked about a lot about these very, very cool libraries. So before we get out of here, though, we touched on this at the beginning, but I'll, I'll ask you this as one of the two main questions at the end of the show. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you use? Um, so the the snarky answer is anything with a, a Vim emulation mode. Um, <laughs> nice. That was the thing that I learned in college. And... Um, I, I specifically avoided answering uh, that si like answering that earlier when we were talking about it, but um, that's what I, I learned when I was writing a whole bunch of PHP code, and that's what I used for for years. And then eventually, I found um, Sublime Text, and I really liked that, but um, it kind of seemed dead in the water. Atom came out, but Atom was slow, and so these days um, I'm using VS Code primarily because it has excellent Python integration, but also because it has a lot of, like Facebook builds a lot of the, the things that we used to have on top of Atom called Nuclide, which especially were a lot of like remote editing tools. Okay. Um, we've, we've rebuilt a lot of those on top of VS Code because VS Code is faster, nicer, you know, has better ongoing support from the community and so forth. Nice. Yeah, um, VS Code seems like the natural successor to Atom. Yeah, uh, and and like I said before, it's like I had tried PyCharm at one point, but it's it's one of those cases where I, I touch just enough stuff that's not Python that I really want my tools to work and function the same way regardless. And so VS Code has the better sort of like broader language support, uh, where it's like there there's some days where I just have to write a Bash script and I want it to be able to you know do nice things for Bash or right, or sure. you know I use it as a Markdown editor and it has a Markdown preview. Things like that. Yep. All right. Cool. Sounds good. And then notable PyPI package. I mean, I guess we spent a lot of time on four of them, right? <laughs> or five. Yeah. Also talks about uh, Microsort, Usort. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, uh, the joke answer is I have a package called AIO Seinfeld um, that's built on top of AIO SQLite. And essentially, you give it a database of Seinfeld uh, scripts and you you can search for things by uh, actor or by keyword of what they're saying, and it, it will essentially give you back some elements of dialogue from from a script that contains your search query. And um, this is powering a site I have called SeinfeldQuote.com, which is basically just a huh. a really old bootstrap template that uh, that lets you search for pieces of Seinfeld quotes. And I, I also implemented a, a chat bot in Discord for some of my friends that also uses this. Um, the more serious answer would be the other one that we didn't talk about from OmniLib, which is attribution, which is essentially a, a quick program to automate the generation of change logs and to automate the process of cutting a release for a project. And so I use this on all of the OmniLib projects and essentially... 
I type one command attribution release, uh, I'm sorry, attribution tag, and then a version number, and it will uh, drop a dunder version.py in the project directory. It will create a git tag and lets, it lets you then type in what you want the release notes to be. Uh, it's assuming, you know, a markdown format. And then once it's made that tag, then it regenerates the change log for that, uh, for that tag and retags it appropriately. And so you get this really nice thing where the, the actual tag of the project has both the updated change log and the, the appropriate version number file. So you only ever type the version in once. You only ever type the release notes in once and it gives you, you know, as much help and automation around that as possible. Oh yeah. Okay. Very cool. That's a, a good one. All right. Final call to action. People are excited about async IO, maybe some of the stuff at Omnilib and they want to get started. What do you tell them? Um, if they want to get started on the projects, going to omnilib.dev is the uh, easiest way to find the, the ones that, uh, are currently hosted on the project. Um, we're always welcoming of code review from the community. So even if you're, you know, not a maintainer, if you are interested in reviewing pull requests and giving feedback on things, uh, always welcoming of that. There's never enough time in my own personal life to to review everything or respond to everything. Um, otherwise, if there are things in these projects that you are interested in adding like new features or fixing bugs or whatever, either open an issue or just create a pull request. And I am more than happy to, you know, engage in design decisions or discussions or whatever. Uh, make sure that uh, ideally, if you open a, an issue first, make sure you're not wasting your time on a pull request that's going in the wrong direction. Right, um, right. Otherwise, it's, it's people a, might have this idea, but you're like, this is really inconsistent where this project is meant yeah, to exactly. go or whatever. So you should not, even if it's perfect, you can't accept it, right? So. Good right. Uh, um, so if it's just like a bug fix or something, then, you know, probably just worth creating a pull request and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bite your head off. Um, but otherwise, um, the only other thing I would say is that uh, LGBTQ things are very personal to me. And so I would ask that if you're in a position to do so, that you please donate to an LGBTQ charity that um, will help in the community. There's two that I really like. One is called Power On, and that's a, a, a charity that donates technology to LGBTQ youth. Um, they do either homeless or disadvantaged, and um, they have that at poweronlgbt.org. And then the other one is the Trevor Project, which is crisis intervention and a suicide hotline for LGBTQ youth. And that's at thetrevorproject.org. Um, yeah, awesome. Those are just two examples, but there are plenty. Um, worst case, just donate to a food bank near you. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a great advice. Great uh, call to action. Um, it seems like your projects are also really open to new contributors, people getting into open source. So participating yes. in that way seems like a great, great thing. Fantastic. All right, John. Well, thank you so much for being on Talk Python. It's been great to have you here. Thank you for having me so much. I really appreciate it. You bet. Yeah, it's been fun to talk about all the async IO stuff. Right. Now, before I close the live stream, a uh, quick question. Suyesh asks, uh, can I give a roadmap for the courses? Uh, that would be super helpful for beginners. Suyesh, if you're still here, can you tell me if you mean like what courses I recommend for beginners or what courses are coming out that might be relevant to beginners? Let me, uh, if you're still here, give me a sense of like uh, structuring that. Otherwise, I'll answer the first part that came to mind anyways. Like what we got coming up, we actually have a Modern Python Projects course coming up that talks about a lot of the tools that we touched on here and things like poetry, uh, setting up continuous integration, working with VS Code, uh, a lot of tools around just like making modern projects and something like attribution seems like it would fit really well in there as well. Uh, that we have a second fast API course coming, but yeah. All right, well, I'm not seeing anything, but there's the answer anyway, so yes, if you come back and watch it. All right, thanks again, John, and thanks everyone for watching.